There's still a few people coming in, so we're gonna just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Aaron Rubenstein, and I'm the head of the Special Collections and University Archives here at, at UMass Amherst. And I want to welcome everybody on this beautiful night in Western Mass uh, to uh, remembering a pioneer exploring the legacy of Dr. Lester Grinspoon. So today, uh, June 24th, 2021, is, is an auspicious day for several reasons. But today would have been Lester Grinspoon's 93rd birthday, and tomorrow will be the first anniversary of his passing. This year is also the 50th anniversary of Lester's revolutionary book, Marijuana Reconsidered, a book that was a serious blow to the stigma and misrepresentation of cannabis' use and effects, and a guiding document for the movement to end cannabis prohibition. I truly could not think of a better day to gather and celebrate Lester's profound impact on our scientific understanding of drugs and drug policy, and his impact on a wide variety of different movements, organizations, and people. We are, are really honored and excited to host this panel of medical practitioners, researchers, activists, innovators, and leaders, all of whom can trace the impact of Lester on their work and lives. I also want to acknowledge the members of Lester's family whose original idea it was to hold this event, Lester's widow Betsy and their sons, David and Peter, all of whom shaped this panel into what it is. So the special collections here at UMass Documenting drug policy is a key part of our collecting focus, which is to preserve the history of activists and organizations fighting to bring positive change to our society and make that history available to cur current and future researchers. We've been collecting drug policy history for over nine years with varying support from the university, though, though it's actually changing in a positive direction uh, over the last five years, as you can imagine. Um, and we've succeeded in building a robust collection, including the records of Normal, the Marijuana Policy Project, and of course, the papers of Lester Grinspoon, all of which provide unprecedented resources for those researching the history of the movement to end the prohibition of cannabis, psychedelics, and, and beyond. So we're at a dramatic moment in the history of drug policy. Uh, with the birth and rapid growth of the cannabis industry happening as we speak, the legalization of psychedelics in the not too distant future, fingers crossed, uh, it, it's never been more important to capture this history and make it possible for researchers to understand the risks, sacrifices and innovation that was necessary to reach this moment. And also of course, to understand all that's happening now. So to that end, today we are also announcing a fund created in Lester's honor called the Lester Grinspoon Fund for Drug Policy Collections. The first goal of the fund is to help make it possible to put all of Lester's research notes and correspondence online for free. This will make Lester's legacy as a founding father of modern, of modern drug policy available to all. As the fund grows, it will allow us to continue to support our work documenting drug policy and help us connect researchers from a variety of backgrounds with these important resources. So the Zoom page on your browser should redirect to a page where you can donate. And you can also go directly to, uh, to a page where you, can, where you can contribute. And that page is at minute fund, um, like minute fund, like minuteman.umass.edu uh, slash Grinspoon Fund. Um, so that's minute fund.umass.edu slash Grinspoon Fund. Finally, uh, this event is really a prelude to an in-person symposium next summer, where we will spend a whole day celebrating Lester and his impact, diving deeper into the full range of Lester's work, and hearing from more voices integral to Lester's legacy. So stay tuned for information about that event. So now, without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton to Richard Dick Evans, who will serve as moderator. So Dick Evans, who has been a Western Massachusetts lawyer since 1973, authored the first comprehensive marijuana regulation taxation plan to be introduced as legislation in any state. As a member of Normal's board of directors in the 90s, 
He was the moving force behind their principles of responsible cannabis use, which is now adopted worldwide, and was awarded Normal's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011. His numerous op-eds and other writings helped shape and propel the counter-prohibitionist narrative and in 2016, he chaired the Massachusetts Yes on Four Initiative Campaign Committee and served on the drafting committee, which produced the first legalization law to include a social equity mandate. It's also impossible to introduce Dick without also mentioning that he's a proud townie. And it goes without saying that the Pioneer Valley is very, very lucky to have him. So take it away, Dick. Thanks so much, Aaron. It's really a great honor and privilege to be here today. And so wonderful to see some old friends and, and make some new ones. Uh, when I uh, started my career as a cannabis reform activist some 45 years ago, um, one of the first things I did was decide to learn as much as I could about the repeal of alcohol prohibition in 1933. So one of the first things I did was drive down the street to the UMass Library and went up to the stacks and found shelffuls of books on prohibition, but very little on repeal. But I did find one book which led me eventually to the archives of a college in Connecticut that contained the papers of the Voluntary Committee of Lawyers, which uh, inspired 40 years of my work with uh, marijuana legalization. They, are, they were the group of lawyers that actually provided the architecture for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. And uh, uh, it was that experience in going through their papers in that archive uh, when I really discovered what the value of original archives were. They give such a fuller picture and a record of what people are thinking and what they're doing and what motivates them and what frustrates them and how they struggle with the forces of the day that were so resistant to social change. So I think what makes Lester's archive and the drug policy archive so really important and timely today is that the reform of drug policy represents a recognition that the drug laws were enacted and have been enforced for the purpose of oppressing minorities. And that's why we have the social equity provisions and the legalization statutes uh, starting with Massachusetts. Um, in the future, when researchers are, uh, are, are trying to determine what propelled one of the most significant social changes of our day, namely marijuana legalization, their path will necessarily lead to the papers of Lester Grinspoon. And I, I wanna commend the UMass Library and the Special Collections and Archives, archives for taking on this collection. It's a really significant and important thing and a great, wonderful and most valuable thing to have for the university to have. Um, We've got, a, we've got a wonderful panel tonight, a great show for you tonight, I guess I should say. Uh, our first uh, uh, speaker will be Alan St. Pierre, the long-term uh, executive director of Normal and alumnus of UMass, and the guy who paid, played a very key role in the uh, acquisition of the drug policy uh, archive at UMass. Then we'll hear from Rick Doblin, the uh, executive director of MAPS, multi -association, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. The organization has done more than anybody else on this planet to promote research in the psychedelics and uh, safe and legal, op legal opportunities for their use. Uh, then we'll hear from Stacy Gruber, a neuroscientist at McLean Hospital in uh, Boston, who's leading studies on the impact of marijuana use on the brain in both adults and minors. Um, that's really critical today because brain damage is the, the reason that's all so often asserted to take it slow with regard to policy reform. Then we'll hear from Dr. Janesta Wilson King, uh, an OBGYN in Florida, founder of the Victory Rejuvenation Center, and which is a cutting edge medical practice uh, incorporating cannabis into healthy aging, a topic I think that will be front and center when boomers start filling up nursing homes. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Peter Grinspoon, a uh, primary care physician at uh, Mass General, a cannabis specialist, the author of the funniest book you'll ever read on drug addiction, and the son of whom Lester and Betsy Grinspoon were so proud. Um, I'm gonna ask each panelist to take about five minutes, to talk about the significance of Lester's work, the importance of the archives, and then we'll entertain a few questions. So uh, uh, Alan, it's your, you have the floor. Thank you, Dick. And thank you, UMass, for doing this. This is a, 
terrific. Uh, this is almost uh, 10 years into this effort of building up this archive. And while uh, marijuana will be the foundation of it, it really expands to all of drug policy reform. Uh, most notably, I think today, psychedelics, which is why I'm so happy that Rick Doblin was able to join us today, because I really think that uh, as Lester had articulated in any number of his books and papers, that, uh, that that was the next phase of marijuana, psychedelics, and then move on to other harm reduction uh, based policies, all of which are happening, making Lester so effing prescient. <laughs> so we, we really appreciate the fact that um, for all these years, that academic body is now fully blooming um, I so wish I was a medical student today and knowing that uh, you've got a tabla rasa to do this uh, as compared to Lester and for that matter Rick when he was a graduate student in the 70s and 80s um, how really difficult it was this was still uh, um, very much voodoo taboo subject matter. So we love Lester's intellectuality, but I also loved his activism. Not only was he one of the great leaders of marijuana law reform, but uh, he was not a one trick pony. <laughs> he was a leader in the MX missile, anti MX missile um, movement. Uh, he was an activist against um, abusive enforcement of drug laws all around the world. He and the former attorney general, Ramsey Clark, would represent people pro bono in terrible absolute worst cases no one would ever touch. They would get on a plane and fly around the world and commit weeks of, of their time and effort to uh, save the life of a young person who was caught up in the worst possible situation regarding drug law. So uh, Lester was not only a mentor and a good friend, but uh, really the reason why I stayed at Normal for the better part of 25 years. Um, I was there about three or four years before Lester came in as the chairman and reorganized the entire organization. And uh, uh, with, that, with appointing Keith Strop as the director, um, it was clear to me that uh, the organization was about to enjoy a completely different phase. And I was so glad I was able to work and in, be involved at that level. So Lester is uh, a hero to thousands and thousands of people in this country um, at an intellectual level, at an activist level. Um, and as on a personal level, I just miss him a year later that we don't have the, his, his wisdom and his compassion and sympathy and to also sort of enjoy the fruits of our labor and see all these things happen. I'm sure he would have loved to know that Connecticut between the, became the 19th state to legalize marijuana just yesterday. So I think he would take a lot of solace in that. Uh, thanks, Alan. You can say anything about uh, his papers going to UMass Amherst? Well, um, so certainly along with normals and uh, individuals, um, myself, Keith Strops, many others, to build this uh, uh, platform. And Lester's was the one that we always wanted. And it was unfortunate that Harvard and Tufts and some of the other universities that he was associated with um, didn't have the foresight to realize uh, how important these archives are. So um, it really is uh, just crucial that Lester and Betsy and the family decided to be involved with UMass, which for me is wonderful because this is a, a, a project I'd like to see to its fruition and to raise all the money necessary to make this, a part of this archive free and jump out online so that as you indicate, when we're all pushing up daisies or cannabis plants, um, it's going to be uh, an amazing archive for people to learn how did we change such a um, remarkable embedded series of laws and it took over 50 years and a cast of tens of thousands of people. Great. Uh, okay, um, let's move on to Rick Doblin. Rick, why don't you talk about Lester for a while? I would be glad to. Thank you all for having me here today. Uh, Profiles and Courage by uh, John Kennedy was a book that was really inspirational to me as I was a young boy reading it. And I feel that Lester would be uh, well served to be in a new edition of Profiles of Courage. That when I think about Lester, I think about him as someone who was willing to challenge the accepted wisdom about the dangers of marijuana, the dangers of psychedelics at the risk of his career. And I first got to know Lester 
in the early 1980s. I, I learned about MDMA in 1982, and it was both a therapeutic drug, but also being sold in a more public settings as ecstasy. And while it was legal, um, myself, Debbie Harlow, a few others who were planning as part of the psychedelic community to deal with the inevitable crackdown that, that would come, because this was during the time of Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan, that and the escalation of the drug war, we were looking for various allies that, that we could introduce MDMA to who would be willing to try it when it was still legal and then who might be willing to testify once this uh, crackdown came and we would try for a lawsuit against the DEA. And Lester was one of the main people that we sought out. And on this theme of uh, profiles and courage, um, Lester was not only willing to be helpful, but he was willing to try MDMA himself and what he said is that he tried it with Betsy and that they had such a you know, deep and wonderful and, and enduring lifelong relationship. But he talked about how under the influence of MDMA, they were able to talk about the death of their son, Danny, by cancer in a way that they hadn't been able to express that to each other before. No matter how well they knew each other and how open they were with each other, that was just such a painful topic that they weren't fully able to express it. And so Lester was able to, and Betsy were able to communicate at a deeper level from the MDMA. And what that did is that motivated Lester to then become one of the main litigants. Once 1984 came around and DEA did move to criminalize MDMA. And I went to Washington and asked for a hearing and Lester was willing to put his name on something that was so controversial. And he became really one of the, the lead uh, experts about the value of uh, MDMA. And he'd previously written about the value of psychedelics, the value of MDMA. And I just found him to be so courageous that um, it, was, it was admirable. And he became a, a mentor of mine in, in many, many different ways. And what he at one time shared with me that, um, you know, his career was really at risk for the work that he was doing. And despite the fact that he had started the Harvard Mental Health Letter and was bringing uh, large amounts of money into uh, Harvard Medical School, um, he never was appointed a full professor. But he was told that if he would just give up what he was doing on marijuana and be quiet about that, that he could get this coveted promotion. And to his credit, he refused to do that. And that was just such an admirable principled position and he also was willing to stand out in so many other different ways. And we've, we've heard from, you know, Ellen about the other kind of activism that, that he had. Um, I, I just admired him so much. And I was just, um, this, this combination of intellectual rigor and willing to take um, where the data led him, even in the face of career problems and in the face of, um, social pressure and, and not being able to get the kind of commotion that he wanted. Um, so one of the things I learned from him was this sense about the importance of therapy, that while he was very interested in um, you know, research, he was also interested in healing. And so it was the applications of marijuana for a whole range of uh, clinical indications that he gathered these stories. He was the one that really made it so that people could um, learn from other people's experiences and see all the different ways that marijuana could be helpful to him. Um, he cataloged that he became the main person in the world really that was gathering these stories and sharing them with others. And he also did uh, something similar to some of his books on psychedelics that uh, he was like a shining light in academia. And I, I think his position at Harvard Medical School, his position within American psychiatry and his courage was just remarkable. And so I, I think this idea of gathering his papers together and having them to be a resource for researchers, scientists. And I, I think it is one of the main social struggles of our day. How do we end this horrific uh, drug prohibition? And Lester will be a... Um, foremost figure in this effort. And we can learn a lot from him for other social issues as well. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, how would you describe the, the or do you expect that the social change that is likely to occur with the reform of psychedelics or our policies concerning psychedelics 
will it be parallel to the way marijuana reform is unfolded, do you think? Um, I think it will be. I think it'll be um, in some ways a little bit easier because of the work that's been done with marijuana. But what we see with marijuana is that medical marijuana changes people's minds about the risks and the benefits and that people have been sold the bill of goods and have been told exaggerated risks about marijuana and also about psychedelics. And it's the medicalization and the science behind the medicalization, the scientific research that will change people's minds and make it so that they'll start questioning why are these drugs illegal in the first place? So I think the way in which Lester really pioneered the medicalization of marijuana and gathering those stories, and then that changing people's attitudes towards legalization. But also I think what Lester did so well was to understand that the, the broad public responds better to stories than to data. And that you really need to have this sort of change in public opinion that then gives courage to the politicians to, to then follow that. And so the way in which Lester gathered stories of people, some people might say, oh, that's just anecdotal, that, that's not you know, always from clinical trials, what is it worth? But I think he really understood that stories are what are compelling to people. And I think we will have so many stories from people that have come to these psychedelic clinics that we'll be establishing. And it's gonna be those stories that are filtering through society that will end up changing people's attitudes towards psychedelics. For so long, uh, uh, advocates like us and activists talked about how, how marijuana and other prohibited drugs weren't so bad. We never talked about how good they were. But Lester was a pioneer there, wasn't he? He was one of the few with the courage, not only to say marijuana wasn't so bad, but it has really important benefits. Would you agree with that? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I think again, this theme of profiles and courage. You know, L Lester was willing to speak the truth as he saw it, as he experienced it, regardless of how controversial that might be. And yes, it, it, the the risks were exaggerated, but the, the suppression of research is what made it so difficult for there to be a lot of these stories about benefits, particularly backed by science. So. Where we're at now with this renaissance of psychedelic research is that we now have clinical data from quite a few number of studies, including our recently published study about MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD, our first phase three study published in Nature Medicine that give support from a scientific basis for the anecdotal stories. But Lester was willing to look at both. And, and while we talk about he was challenging the risks and he was, um, you know, talking about the benefits, he wasn't minimizing the risks. I think that was the other thing that I really appreciated him, that, that he felt that you needed to be honest about the risks as well as the benefits. And he, so he wasn't a propagandist. You could say that the contrast from uh, Harvard Medical School, or not, or Harvard, meaning Leary, was uh, someone who was kind of a, a promoter of the benefits, exaggerating the benefits and uh, minimizing the risks. And I think that Leary felt that the general society was kind of suppressing information and research into the benefits and was exaggerating the risks. But Lester felt that that wasn't the way to go either, that, that you could talk about the benefits, but that you had to be really honest about the risks. So it was scientific and intellectual rigor and honesty that was part of his uh, profile and courage. Th thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, let's turn to uh, Stacy Gruber. Stacy, you're on. Well, thanks so much. And, and really, it's a privilege and an honor to be here tonight among uh, such esteemed colleagues and really honoring uh, a true pioneer in every way one can be a pioneer. Um, this is somebody who understood what I call the art of science and medicine, who ultimately reshaped the course of history and started what I would consider a sea of social change. Um, I think what other people have talked about is so important. His exploration of cannabis or marijuana may have begun as a way to confirm the prohibition stance but as Rick so aptly points out, he didn't really minimize the risk. He said, look, there's reason to be concerned for some people, but, but, it was always a but. Um, after all, it was at that time considered a very harmful drug associated with a number of dangers. And his goal was to, I'll never forget this, define scientifically the nature and degree of the dangers, right? Um, but after several years of intensive research, like every good scientist, he had to sort of reshape his perspective. That's what he did. Um, I think, Again, it's really important to remember that it's not always what's the most popular or what's the most convenient perspective. 
Um, you have to readily acknowledge that trying out new ideas requires taking in and considering new data and perspectives. And this is where he really was so extraordinary, right? This is somebody who was able to say, hold on, <laughs> it's not what I thought. So let's, let's have a different conce conceptual perspective of this. Um, and again, to the perspective that Rick raised, which is an issue very near and dear to my heart as I sit here at <clears throat> Harvard Medical School, um, despite the contrary and the controversy and the very local and more global naysayers, he persevered at tremendous risk, tremendous risk. This is not an easy road. This is not an easy place to be. It's not an easy area of research, whether it's cannabis or quote, just marijuana, as I, I often hear people say on one side and the other side, people say, oh, are you crazy? You're going to devote your what to doing, huh? Uh, and now psychedelics, you know, we hear it on the same side, but those of us who have, again, sort of been in this for a while say, hold on, you know, take, take, take a step back. He was able to do this many, many moons ago. He really set the tone, um, if you will. And I like to remind anybody who will, who will listen, really, that ultimately science is supposed to seek to tell the truth. Uh, that's the point, not opinion or rhetoric, the truth. Um, his landmark work, I think, was not only an inspiration to, to me, but to, I don't know how many countless millions of others, but it really did underscore for folks that I know, and certainly for me, a passion for conducting empirically sound research, again, to, the, to, to Rick's point, and, and thanks so much. It's so nice to go after Rick because he laid all the groundwork. Um, it's really important to have empirically sound data to help back up what we know in our hearts to be true. Every great scientific discovery begins with a an anecdotal finding. That's how it begins. But to summarily dismiss it because we don't have empirically sound studies, the, the you know, open label to double blind placebo controlled trials, which are the, the gold standard. So if we don't have it, it must be garbage. That's, that's just not the way forward. And thankfully he was able to really point that out and to underscore this. Um, you know, again, his work sort of underscored my passion for trying to contribute in whatever way I could. I've been at it for more than <clears throat> 30 years. We don't like to acknowledge that part, but it's true. Um, and sure, there are reasons to be concerned. Anything that, uh, that can have a positive effect can also have a negative effect, but you have to keep things in perspective. And that's really the point here. Um, I think that his work was so incredibly important to me and my abilities to see a way forward again. <laughs> Let's just say it this way in a very diplomatic, uh, from a di very diplomatic perspective, the Harvard perspective, the Harvard um, environment is not necessarily the easiest within which to navigate uh, a life or career around cannabis or marijuana research. Um, he made that very clear and he didn't care, didn't matter. He did what was right, not what was easy. And that's the way science moves forward. If you want to move the needle forward, you have to do what's right. Not what's easy or convenient, but what's right. So I, I owe a tremendous debt to Lester Grinspoon because I think without much of his work, I wouldn't have had the ability to start this program. The Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery Program is the only program in the country dedicated to looking at the impact of medical cannabis on a number of different outcomes, brain structure, brain function, clinical state, quality of life, sleep, of course, a number of different symptoms and conditions. But the idea is not just to look at the negative, but to look at the positive. You have to look at what I call the good, the bad, and the truth. You have to just take it holistically. Um, ultimately, the goals are to, to really generate ecologically valid, empirically sound data to do exactly what Rick's talking about, to help change the hearts and minds of people for whom these types of things are critical. You have to have them to back up the anecdotal thing, but it's not one or the other. They go together. They go together. And you have to have some vision you have to be able to think outside the box in order to make those things come true. And thankfully, he had vision. Um, I will never forget, I think it's the end of the introduction to Marijuana Reconsidered. He quotes the ancient proverb, it's still better to light one candle than to curse the darkness, right? And when I think about his legacy and I look at the future, whether it's cannabis or, or psychedelics, I see nothing but light. And the ability to sort of move forward in a way that will change the way we consider medicine. Um, and we all owe a debt of gratitude to, to Lester Greenspan. So I know I- Thanks, Stacey. Uh, you know, I think all of us have heard Lester say that cannabis will turn out to be the miracle drug of the 21st century, like penicillin was of the 20th century. I think we've all heard him say that dozens of times. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What tells, is, 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 he, is he right there? I think that ultimately, when we think of cannabis or cannabinoids, um, you're talking about what could ultimately be sort of the the, the penultimate sort of personalized medicine. 
Um, this is an extraordinarily complex plant, as most of my esteemed colleagues know. It isn't one thing. We have one term, and we use it to define anything that comes from the plant, whether it's cannabinoid constituents, terpenoids, flavonoids, anything. Um, and that's really, really important. I think that there are tremendous opportunities for harnessing therapeutic potential and mitigating risk and harm. Uh, so I think that we've seen the explosion. My favorite is people say, oh, great that, you, great that you decided to do this new thing, the green rush, the cannabis. And I said, no. First documented use of cannabis as medicine goes back to 2700 BC. It was legal in this country uh, starting in 1850, right? It was, uh, you know, became illegal in the mid thirties and, and taken out of the, the pharmacopoeia by 1942. But this isn't new. We're starting to have a different appreciation at this point for what it really can do and what the future might hold. But I think there's certainly a lot of hope and optimism, which is appropriate for the potential therapeutic applications for cannabis and cannabinoids in much the same way that we see now with psychedelics. I mean, it's finally time for people to, to take a clear look. All right. Thanks, Stacy. I'm embarrassed to correct you by saying that Massachusetts was the first state to enact a prohibition law against cannabis in oh, no. 1911. <clears throat> no, what I meant was it was part of our pharmacopoeia in 1850. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So doctors didn't have a recommendation or certification they prescribed it. It wasn't, you know, it, it sort of was around. But, but yes, from the national stage, uh, Massachusetts does not necessarily always fare so well. But that's <laughs> indeed, indeed. Thanks a lot, uh, Janester. You're up. Introduce yourself again and uh, take the floor. I will do that. Thank you very much, and good evening to everyone. I am really honored and pleased to be here. I am a. Uh, I'm not from Massachusetts or in Massachusetts, but I'm really honored to be among these esteemed colleagues. This is really wonderful. Uh, I'm a boarded OBGYN uh, with over 20 years of clinical experience. And for the last 11 years, of, uh, I've been practicing a, an integrative wellness medicine practice in which I provide life transforming management modalities and customized medicines to my patients. So you see how cannabis fit well, fit right into that, that, uh, that my practice and what became a major part of my toolbox. And I have to say that Dr. Grinspoon's books, Marijuana Reconsidered and Marijuana, The Forbidden Medicine were the first two books I read about cannabis and they were very influential in my journey to become a cannabis clinician. And uh, th they opened my eyes and started me on a path on which I'm still forging. To this day, I quote stories from his books to my patients. And uh, he, Dr. Grinspoon is the reason I'm a cannabis clinician or as he termed it, a cannabinopathic clinician. That was one of his terms, I really found that to be a very a, a nice term. Uh, in the last three years, I've co-authored three research articles on the assessment of the impact of cannabis on female and male sexual function. And I attribute that desire because as a clinician, I never had, I never thought I would get into research, but because of my, uh, because of Dr. Grinspoon's influence, research became a part of my professional career. And I find that amazingly fantastic. Uh, that first book, uh, I read a quote, there was a quote and Dr. Grinspoon said that first book was to reassure me and the rest of the world that we were all wrong about this, that this is a remarkably non-toxic drug. It's the only drug I know of that you can't establish a death from or an, uh, from an overdose. Now, Fred Gardner, and Jeff Hergenrather, who I've been, uh, I've known for the past six years now uh, through the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. I'm the current vice president. And Fred is a very good friend of, of Lester's. And he said, maybe the most influential thing Dr. Grinspoon ever wrote was his article on marijuana in the December, 1969, issue of Scientific American, and it conferred a new measure of respectability on the illegal plant. 
The magazine was in its heyday and it was widely trusted by scientists seeking to stay abreast of developments in the specialties other than their own. So uh, marijuana by Lester Grinspoon was an eye opener for many. And David Nathan, the founder and president of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, which is an organization I'm also on the board of, and that's how I met Peter. Uh, Dr. Nathan stated that Dr. Grinspoon will live on in the hearts of everyone for whom he is a guiding light and a nation that owes him a great debt for his lifetime of sacrifices and good works. Dr. Grinspoon spoke truth about cannabis and drug policy reform like a sole beacon of tolerance and compassion. And it came at a time of professional sacrifice to him while policymakers and educators were building the war on drugs. Now, Dr. Hergenrather writes, with great concern for the vulnerability of the public facing a diagnosis of cancer, LG, which is what he, how he refers to Dr. Grinspoon, called Dr. Hergenrather to ensure that physicians recommending cannabis would do so with honesty, accuracy, and integrity, knowing firsthand that cannabis could alleviate symptoms of cancer and cancer treatment without necessarily impacting the outcome of the disease. LG and his wife, Betsy, were very generous hosts to Fred Gardner and Dr. Hergenrather when they visited him at his home on more than one occasion. They had lots of walks in the park and long conversations. Now, Dr. Grinspoon and I have something in common. We are parents who lost a child, a tragedy in which we both had to endure and you endure it for the rest of your life. Peter and I have something in common. He and I attended the same undergrad, Swarthmore College. We are Swatis, though I have to say, Peter was there a little bit before I was. <laughs> but I, it's been great getting to know Peter on the, being on the board of uh, DFCR. And I, I want him to live on as he has in his father's honor because he is is uh, I have such a great regard for Peter. I didn't meet Lester personally, but I certainly have a great regard for him. But knowing Peter, I, I, I'm learning more and more about Lester. But I also want to say that all three of us love the cannabis plant and its benefits as a medicine. And I'm sure many of you here this evening do as well. So many, many, many people Cannabis clinicians, physicians, advocates, veterans, and warriors for justice can say that Dr. Grinspoon had an impact on their professional and or personal lives. That is so true. We are all indebted to his legacy of work and the tremendous sacrifices his, he made. The UMass Library is, will, his, the legacy they are collecting will be a shining light on his work and his sacrifices for many more people and from which many more can learn. And by the way, how beautiful is it that Dr. Grinspoon lived to see cannabis legalized in Massachusetts? That's just awesome. So I thank you for this event and I, I thank you for the honor of participating. Thank you, Janesta. Uh, that's a great segue into our last uh, panelist, uh, Peter Grinspoon. Peter, why don't you introduce yourself again and and uh, have a few words. Well, I'm Peter Grinspoon, I'm Lester's son. Um, I'm not the Dr. Grinspoon that the strain of cannabis Dr. Grinspoon is named after. And um, I, uh, primary care doctor, and I also do a lot of cannabis medicine. I uh, have things that I wanna comment about that everybody said, but I actually prepared something to say, which I rarely do, I usually wing it, which I learned to do from my dad. My dad was so incredible at just like winging these speeches. It was absolutely spectacular. and I. My whole life I've been working on doing that because I so admired him for that. But I, I did want to mention just um, uh, Dr. Janester, I love that picture of um, Jerry Garcia um, holding that picture of Scientific American on an album cover. So mm -hmm. apparently he got Jerry Garcia interested in marijuana. I'm sure he never would have discovered it anyways. 
And um, Stacy, I understand that, believe me, being at Harvard, that the, the troubles of being a cannabis physician at Harvard, it's like, I'll put a patient on medical cannabis for pain or for insomnia, and then they'll see their psychiatrist, you know, an hour later at Harvard, and the psychiatrist will be like, oh, you're in cannabis, you have cannabis use disorder. I mean, it <laughs> completely undermines everything that I'm doing. It's so ridiculous. So it is a challenge. And Alan, um, you know, it's true that Harvard didn't have the insight or the prescience to ask for his records, but um, they actually did about five years ago. And I was like, sorry, you UMass did 20 years ago, you're out of luck. But they did, you know, cause it's really interesting. They've been like airbrushing him slowly back into the picture you know, they airbrushed him out for decades, like Lester who, but now they're airbrushing him back in slowly as the pendulum starts to swing, but you know, it was about 15 years too late to get his archives, but it's interesting, they did ask. And then Rick, um, you know, it's interesting, you talk about my mom and my dad in ecstasy. I, it reminds me that I did wanna say my mom was the genius behind the genius and she just deserves so much credit. They were married for 66 years. I've never seen a happier marriage. They still were holding hands to the very end, not because they were like, you know, afraid of falling, but they actually really liked each other. And, um, you know, it was really incredible. And, you know, my poor, innocent, mild-mannered mom, Rick is talking about her on ecstasy. I'm going to be talking about her buying drugs illegally, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and she tries to cultivate this innocent, this image of like innocent purity. So sorry about that, mom. But anyways, my dad, you know, this, this event is about my dad's legacy and his work, but it's about introducing his archives. But when you think about it, my dad's life was sort of a living archive about the war on drugs. You know, he was um, nine years old in 1937 when Harry Enslinger, you know, rammed through the Marijuana Tax Act. And he was in his early 40s when three things happened that were related to each other. Number one, in the early 1970s, Richard Nixon um, declared his war on drugs. Number two, in 1971, which many of you have alluded to, his masterpiece came out, Marijuana Reconsidered, which provided such sort of credibility, integrity, and, and firepower, intellectual firepower to the nascent legalization movement. Of course, when Richard Nixon heard about that, he called my dad a clown um, in one of his briefings. But of course, the next 50 years is sort of determined who's the clown and who's not the clown. And the third thing that happened is that my parents started buying cannabis illegally to my, for my brother, Danny, who was suffering uh, from the ravages of childhood leukemia. And, you know, just seeing how my brother benefited from cannabis and was able to hold down food despite the chemotherapy really uh, inoculated me from all the nonsense they feel compelled to, to teach doctors about cannabis in medical school. And having my dad as a role model um, and just seeing his scholarship and his advocacy really launched my career, not only in medicine, but in, in medical cannabis. And just the fact that he was such a good role model I think he launched the career of hundreds, if not thousands of people, which is just so remarkable. I mean, I just heard from so many people that said, yeah, I was doing exactly as Janester said, I was doing, I was exposed to his work and I decided to go into research or into medicine uh, and pursue cannabis or psychedelics or other drug policy. Um, it's really remarkable the ripple effect that his career has had. Um, my dad was 51 when his prescient book, Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered came out. Um, I read it when I was 14 or 15 when it came out and the book itself made total sense to me. Let's use these wondrous substances to treat some of the cruelest conditions in psychiatry that the traditional psychiatric drugs weren't treating. That made perfect sense. What didn't make sense to me at that age was why it got such a cool reception from the other psychiatrists. That took me decades to figure out. It was so bizarre to me as a teenager, like why isn't everybody shouting this from the rooftops? I mean, I'm so glad that people are finally getting it uh, largely due to the work of Rick and, and many, many others uh, after all these years. I mean, it just seems like such a no brainer. Um, my dad was 55 when his book, Drug Control in a Free so Society came out. He wrote that with his close friend and close collaborator, James Bacalar, who I believe is in the audience tonight. Uh, he and Jake were like inseparable. And pretentiously, um, the book Drug Control in a Free Society came out in the year 1984. And we had many years of really bad drug control in a not so free society. But this book was so eloquent and it's so relevant today. I reread it just for, for tonight. And it has so many great quotes like, why do well-informed people often see less danger in drugs than ill-informed ones? 
Why are drug laws so severe compared to the other consumer safety laws? What kind, what sort of consumer protection is this? I mean, these questions are so incisive and they beg so many more questions. Now, obviously I can't talk about all of his books because that would take about a month. I'm gonna just mention one more. Um, he was 65 years old in 1993 when his book, Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine came out, which um, as Janester uh, alluded to, provided a vital roadmap to any and all physicians who are curious, brave, or sensible enough to use cannabis as a medicine. And this book provided essential credibility at just the right time to the legalization movement and to the patient rights movements. And lo and behold, three years later, California legalized medical cannabis. And then after that, it was like a domino effect. I mean, it really, all the pieces fit together. And I just wanna mention, um, it wasn't always easy for my dad. Um, you know, there was a lot of hate mail, you dirty Jew, you're just doing it for the money. And you know, that that's kind of funny because he actually gave away most of the royalties and most of the honorarium. Um, as we alluded to earlier, he was less than supported by the medical school where he worked for 50 years. And you know, the other doctors didn't always appreciate him because he confronted them again and again and again about their hypocrisy for being on the wrong side of the war on drugs. I mean, we all recognize that the war on drugs is just a war against people or certain types of people. And doctors who are supposed to do no harm have been on the wrong side of this war. My dad would just point this out, sort of like the emperor wears no clothes. It was not that difficult a thing to understand, but the doctors would just be so incensed that he'd point that out. And he'd also be uh, pointing out the harm they do, the incalculable harm they would do by just parroting government propaganda about the different drugs, cannabis and all the other drugs, instead of like thinking for themselves and um, following the evidence. But in any case, um, I remember my dad's delight at age 88 um, when in the year 2016, uh, Massachusetts finally legalized uh, recreational and adult use cannabis. Um, he was starting to show his age uh, by then and starting to slow down a little bit, but you know, not too much that he couldn't celebrate it with a bunch of friends in a huge cloud of, of cannabis smoke. But he knew at that point that there was still a lot of work to do. And he was philosophical about the fact that much of this work would get done after he passed because he was 88 and you know was only legal in about half the states. So we were getting there, but he knew there was a lot of work to get done. But he could see um, two things. First of all, he could see that the side of reason and compassion was slowly but surely winning out, at least with respect to drug policy. He was very concerned about some other issues like climate change, but that's for a, another day. And he actually was like one of the humblest people I knew. He grew up dirt poor and um, they had nothing when they were growing up. Um, literally, he was the most self-made man I've ever met. He had nothing. He put himself through college and through, through medical school. And um, in fact, he and my mom, their first date was a blind date at an Adlai Stevenson rally because my dad couldn't afford any other date. So he took her to an Adlai Stevenson rally, which was free. But anyways, he was the last person to take credit for anything. But eventually with victory after victory after victory, he was finally forced to acknowledge that yes, in fact, he had made a difference. And I just want to close by saying our family is so thrilled that his papers are being preserved at UMass, accessible and useful to scholars for generations to come as they give a detailed roadmap on how to think for yourself, how to dismantle unjust policies, and how to tie together the quest for scientific knowledge to the fight for, si for social justice. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Um... We've got several questions, uh, and I'd like to uh, ask you, Peter, to, to, to respond to the first one and then others to uh, chime in. And the question had to do with uh, your dad's approach to uh, addicts and, addic and addiction and what his thoughts were and how they were instructive to us today. Could you talk about it, that a bit? Sure. Well, I'm not going to use the word um, addicts, even though I just did, because uh, it's stigmatizing language, and I'll get shot by anybody in the addiction field for using it. Um, so people who misuse drugs, um, he was incredibly compassionate. I mean, he had all the pieces. He understood the drugs more than anybody. He understood, he wrote a book about each of the drugs. I mean, nobody understood amphetamines, cocaine, any of the drugs more than he did. He understood cannabis. He 
um, he thought that the um, the claims of cannabis addiction were exaggerated, but he also recognized that some people really do get in trouble. A minority of people really do get um, in trouble with cannabis. I thought he was very level-headed and, and reasonable. We discussed this for hours upon hours. Um, I actually got into trouble early in my career with um, prescription opiates, and then I got out of trouble, but uh, which was not easy, believe me. And he was so incredibly compassionate and understanding and helpful and supportive. It was like, um, the best case scenario in terms of a parent and a mentor and a role model. And I think he was only able to do that because he understood addiction so well. I think he was like a profoundly early adopter of the model that addiction isn't some kind of moral failing or like you're a bad person. I think he genuinely understood it as sort of a, some kind of dysfunction in your, in your brain chemistry. And he, again, he had all the pieces. On the one hand, he understood um, the drugs as well or better than anybody else. And on the other hand, um, this is something we haven't even touched on tonight. He was an absolutely brilliant psychiatrist. He gets all this acclaim for being such a hero and such an expert on drug policy and on you know, the nature of drugs and their history and their mechanism of action. But he was such a brilliant psychiatrist and he did such great work on schizophrenia and in many different areas. And being the founding editor of the Harvard Medical School Mental Health Letter. I mean, that's like what he did in his spare time. But for other people, that would be an entire career. I mean, you have to remember that he was like this completely brilliant psychiatrist. So I think because he had all the pieces, brilliant psychiatrist, a deep intuitive understanding of people, an understanding of all the drugs, and most of all, empathy and compassion. I thought he was just incredibly understanding and supportive of people who are struggling with addiction. And um, I just felt very fortunate to have him help me through my addiction. And I know a lot of other people that have gone through our family, friends, friends of friends, relatives, and he's just been incredibly supportive. Um, my dad, the last thing I'm gonna say is my dad was a person that everybody would call when they had a problem to work through. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Everybody, friends, relatives, friends of friends. If you had a problem that you needed advice for, you'd call my dad because he was just, generous in that way. And he was a very good problem solver. And he just helped everybody with their problems. And these are, he's the kind of person that helped people when nobody was watching, as much as he helped people when everybody was watching. And that's, that's actually the thing I admired the most about him. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, Janesta or Stacy, do you want to add something to what uh, Peter said about the subject of addiction? Or anybody else? Rick? Okay. Um, well, well, I can speak ahead, right? for a moment. Lester was aware that uh, Bill W., the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, had experimented with LSD and thought that LSD had a role to play in the treatment of alcoholics. And so Lester was someone who really wrote about that and understood that we had missed a major um, treatment option for helping people with addiction and because of the stigmatization of psychedelics. And yet he put that forward. And, and also near um, starting later on, he knew about the use of Ibogaine, also a psychedelic drug for the treatment of opiate addiction. And so I think he just saw that there were important areas of the treatment of addiction that we had branded certain things as drugs of abuse. Psychedelics were drugs of abuse. Marijuana was drugs of abuse. And yet in these same drugs were the key to helping people overcome addiction and abuse. And he was willing to uh, promote that. And so I, I think he was very um, nuanced in his thinking. And he understood, I think, fundamentally that these drugs are just tools, that they're not inherently beneficial. They're not inherently harmful. It's how you use them. And I think that was one of the main contributions. Well, that's one of the main lessons that he taught me is that you, you shouldn't uh, demonize these drugs. You shouldn't uh, put a halo around these drugs and say that you automatically get a spiritual experience if you take them, but it's how you use them. And I think that's the fundamental concept that he was really putting forward, that it's their tools and we have to encase them in wise use. And when we do that, these drugs of abuse can be exceptionally helpful in the treatment of people that are dependent on drugs. Yeah, I, I would like to, to add to that that um, I so agree with you, Rick. I believe in marijuana, the forbidden medicine in 
which really is a, a collection of anecdotal stories of patients and their experience of, with experiences with cannabis. And one of the chapters, he did talk about uh, alcohol misuse and how cannabis helped some of those patients stay away from alcohol. So Lester even knew then that cannabis was also helpful with addiction as well. So yeah, totally and agree, Rick. The only other thing that I would add to that because that, that is incredibly um, apropos and true. Um, I think he was also to, to Peter's point, not really afraid to say, hey, listen, there are reasons to be concerned in some circumstances, but not in all circumstances. And when we see use, it doesn't necessarily equate to misuse. And what we see in our patients is significant improvement and reduction in the use of conventional medications, despite the fact. It's true, we don't have tons and tons of empirically sound data, but we have all of these patients that you see that I, we all see coming forward and saying, you know what's funny? I don't need a bottle and a half of wine anymore. I just need this. So um, again, when we think about the sort of forward thinking, highly evolved perspective, it's not that use is equivalent to misuse necessarily, which was the sort of pervasive attitude at the time. If you use, you must be misusing, right? And by the way, if you happen to have some difficulty, this actually may be a way forward um, that is far less onerous and far less um, harmful potentially than, than the alternatives. So. Uh, thanks, Stacey. I, I think one of the great rhetorical triumphs of the drug war was the conflation of use and abuse. And uh, I'm sorry that we never could break through that. It was just remarkable how two words that had opposite meaning somehow passed as synonyms for decades. Just, just remarkable. Um, anybody else got to say anything about addiction or addicts? Uh, 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 well, uh, Here's a question I'd like to ask the entire panel, uh, and that is, what, what, do you have any curiosity about Lester's work or Lester's thoughts that you may think, that you think may be revealed by his papers, by his archives that you're not familiar with? Um, Peter, I heard, I see you nodding there. Um, are there any secrets in your dad's papers? Um, I was nodding because it was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer? <laughs> um, well, if there were secrets, I wouldn't know about them because they're secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you curious about anything you think the papers might reveal? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm curious. Um, you know, I mean, I've heard all his stories so many times that, you know, toward the end, you know, I just sort of tuned them out. So, I mean, I think I know everything that he wanted me to know. Um, but I'd be very curious if there were, there were secrets. Um, I guess that's for the scholars to answer. You know, someone's got to dig through them. Um, yeah, I, I'm very curious, but um, I, I, if there were, I can't imagine what there would be that I wouldn't know about, but there might be, and I'd be, I'd be dying to hear. Well, one thing's for sure that no uh, researcher or student you'll find in the archives is uh, Lester directly profiting from this kind of activism. Um, it was already mentioned that he donated almost all the money, as far as I know, all the money, the royalties, he donated it to the Normal Foundation. If he spoke to uh, an audience that paid him to do it, um, he was expert witness in cases where people paid him tens of thousands of dollars for unrelated stuff. And he said, I will only do it if you give me the money and I donate it to Normal or the Drug Policy Foundation, ACLU, et cetera. Um, and so there are many of us that our entire career has largely uh, arced on marijuana. Um, and, uh, and so my emails, tens and thousands of them are replete with the uh, duplicity of my own interest in using marijuana and also working to reform it. Whereas in Lester was a pure activist. Um. Here's a question that uh, somebody submitted. Uh, what is the next step in implementing the work of Dr. Gray? Whoops, I think oh, the area of psychedelics. Wait, you, Dick, you just froze for a second during the question. Oh, the question was, what is the next step in, in implementing the work of Dr. Grinspoon that may be overlooked by many. 
Well, I, I'll say one thing about that, which is that um, while we have all these medical marijuana states and we're moving more and more to marijuana legalization, the, <coughs> the medical marijuana states have to buy it themselves. And so what's really going to be necessary is taking marijuana in flower form or other forms through the FDA so that it will eventually be covered by insurance. And so one of the things that just happened about a month ago, <coughs> which we really should note, is that the monopoly that the DEA has given to the University of Mississippi as the only federally licensed producer of marijuana growing under contract to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That marijuana can only be used for research, not for commercial sales. It's poor quality. It could never be used in phase three because phase three needs to be the same exact drug that you want to market. And so DEA has now finally licensed uh, several, four, they've given four licenses. Uh, it's a really sad situation that it didn't go to UMass Amherst. So since 2000, I was working with Professor Lyle Craker at UMass Amherst to try to break this monopoly. And we've had lawsuits against the DEA, which we won. Then the administrator of the DEA rejects the recommendations. And the DEA recently um, called UMass Amherst to say, what is this about uh, Professor Craker's application? But Lyle had retired and there was nobody there to take on the mantle of trying to be willing to grow marijuana. So uh, Dr. Sue Sisley did get one of these licenses. But I think the thing that's really necessary to follow up on the work of Lester is to really take the various potentials of marijuana and subject them to clinical trials and make them go through the FDA. And if we can do that for certain clinical indications, then get them covered by insurance. And I think that's the real contribution. That will be the final step of mainstreaming psychedelics is to make them into medicines that you can just go to your doctor and you can have a prescription for it and it will be covered by insurance. That's the really next step. And just on a separate point, just to make sure we get to it, I just want to um, read a little bit of a quote that was, um, uh, I think, about Lester that sort of, again, exemplifies his courage. It's from Nixon. And this was recorded May 26, 1971. And it's where Nixon... Uh, you know, went off on a rant about uh, Jewish people and psychiatry. And uh, let's see, I, I put this in the, um, uh, the, the chat. Let me just um, read it now. So Nixon was saying, um, let's see, here we go. Sorry, just take me just a second to get it. Um, uh, he said, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. Every one of those bastards that are out for legalizing marijuana is Jewish. What the Christ is the matter with the Jews, Bob? He said to top aide, H.R. Haldeman. What's the matter with them? I suppose it's because most of them are psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hear him speaking directly about Lester in that quote. Um, here's a question that somebody submitted. Uh, Can I just say, I have a show and tell. This is yeah. Lester's daily, this is Nixon's daily briefing where he circles marijuana reconsidered, he says, this clown is far to the left, H, H is Haldeman. And it's a little summary of marijuana reconsidered. You can't really read it, but um, a Boston Globe reporter did a Freedom of Information Act. And there's a whole summary of marijuana reconsidered and Nixon circles it and said, this clown is far to the left. And I think this um, actual daily briefing is what precipitated that rant. Right. So I have a little, I have a show and tell that goes along with your, uh, your quote, <laughs> so. Peter, that is great to see. I didn't know that. It's great. <laughs> I'll send you a copy. So, so somebody asks, uh, what was Lester's role in bringing lithium carbonate to the U.S.? I haven't a clue what that is. Go ahead, please. What is it? Lithium was um, the first treatment that really uh, showed a lot of promise in treating bipolar disorder or manic depression is what they called it back then. And they were using it all over the place in Europe and it was showing like really spectacular results. And now we have a lot more, uh, many options in terms of mood stabilizers. So people still use lithium um, from time to time. But back then, maybe 50 years ago, they were using it everywhere in Europe and American psychiatrists were being very timid about using it. So my dad was like, I'm just gonna prescribe this. And he was the first person in North America to prescribe lithium for bipolar disorder. And, you know, since then it became the standard of care. He didn't like pioneer it. It had been pioneered in Europe, but he was literally the first person to prescribe it in North America because no one else wanted to get their feet wet. 
And then after he did that, all the other psychiatrists started doing it and it became standard of care. Uh, thank you, Peter. Anybody else on that one? Dick, if I can go back to the uh, previous question regarding uh, what kind of things need to be done uh, to advance Lester's work. Um, in one of the last meetings I had with he and Betsy at their place in the fall of 2019, so we wound down the discussion. He said, you know, this is great. Marijuana is becoming legal in a number of states. And I, I've got my little stash of Dr. Grinspoon I can legally use here. And, but what's it going to take to, you know, really make this a, a federal law change, et cetera, et cetera. And my suggestion to him is the same one I have to almost everybody I consult with today. Um, and that is that um, it's pretty clear from the data. Democrat in a duopoly that we have for our politics, uh, Democrats are right on the line of where the general public is in support of legalization, about 65 to 70% or so. Republicans are around 35 to 38%. So it's clear that Republicans have to support legalization, decriminalization, and harm reduction more so we can have more unity in these laws. Democrats can force the issue when they can, and they can certainly do it in states where they have full control. But um, the bottom line is, people are going to have to be willing to work with Republicans, donate to Republicans, educate Republicans, for which Lester looked over his glasses and said, better thee than me. <laughs> Curious thing about marijuana that we've observed for so many years is that it's really, it transcends all ethnic, political, social groups. And that's a significant thing when we're talking about social change. And that's what this panel discussion is really all about. It's about uh, Lester's uh, importance and the social change that drug policy reform represents. Um, let's see, another question. Uh, uh, did Dr. Grinspoon have an opinion about the way CBD has been singled out from other medicinal plant components as legal under the farm bill. Anybody want to talk about CBD and Lester? I've got a good one for on this one. This, okay. is, this, and this speaks to um, his caution while uh, being perceived as a mercenary. Uh, there was a longtime activist in the Boston area um, Richard, you would know who he is, <laughs> uh, who decided he wanted to be ahead of the legal curve on both um, recreational marijuana and to some extent CBD. So he opened up a store called Hello CBD in, in a suburb of Boston. And he was selling exclusively CBD products long before any state or federal law would allow so. And uh, Lester found out about it and uh, wrote him a very frank, uh, terse letter uh, letting him know that uh, while he clean, completely supports cannabinoids and cannabinoid research, what he was claiming that um, CBD did for people, he thought was um, uh, fantastical, uh, to, to say the least. Uh, and so he suggested strongly that he put uh, language um, around the um, products and at the point of purchase to make clear that these products um, are not sanctioned and that there is absolutely no scientific peer review to um, buttress the claims for which uh, sent the uh, CBD store owner into a tiz. Uh, but that was classic Lester. He gets a call from Lester Grinsman. He's completely overjoyed. And yet at the same time, he's being chastised correctly. <laughs> uh, Aaron, did you want to come in on that? Are you still there? I guess not. Uh, well, here's a question. I think what everyone's going, how everyone's going to answer it. But someone asked, "Is marijuana reconsidered as good or, and relevant a read today as it was when it was published 50 years ago? How well has it stood up over the last 50 years?" So I, I personally make this recommendation. I have a sort of a small bibliography. When people ask me, "Oh, well, I want to get caught up in so many books," what are the five or ten books? And I always include at least two of these books, which is Lester's Marijuana Reconsidered and Marijuana the Forbidden Medicine. And Reconsidered, I always make clear, it's 50 years old. It was up to date perfectly to the time it was written. Science today has moved warp speeds away from it, but the foundational information, the history, um, the intellectuality 
uh, is important. And so I always put it on my short list of bibliography for any graduate students or anybody who's serious about a building up a library uh, for marijuana or drug policy reform. It's that important. Did, did Lester have anything to say about Delta-8 THC? You hear a lot about that these days. Well, he, not Delta-8 specifically, but he warned both early in the 70s and then articulated many times after that, that people should not become so focused on one cannabinoid that there were 85 to maybe 130 some odd cannabinoids. Um, and so he was an early uh, red flagger on uh, don't get too focused on one specific cannabinoid. Right. How about ibogaine? What did Lester think about ibogaine? <laughs> You're still on, Alan. Well, only because all of us who know how, and this is a, cl a classic example about Lester's ability to hear people's stories before trying to confirm any of their scientific claims. And so to say the least, it was a ragtag team of activists that brought Ibogaine to, to Americans and principally uh, a, a gentleman named Dana Beal. And so, um, uh, Lester, who, who and, was in the New York Times recently. That's right. And, and again, to speak that you can live long enough to be correct. <laughs> and so uh, Dana was um, able to convince Lester and Rick and others to look at this um, African route and figure out, is there something here that could really help um, people who are on opiate addiction? And so Lester gave it a pretty good vetting early on where I cannot imagine many other Harvard professors willing to entertain Dana Beal and company showing up at their door. Uh, thanks, Alan. There, someone asks, to what degree will genetic testing dispel misconceptions about cannabis, psychedelics, and other traditionally maligned drugs? And what would Dr. Grinspoon have thought about it? Genetic testing and misconceptions about cannabis psychedelics and other traditionally maligned drugs. I'm not sure what the connection is there. Anybody got any ideas? Sure. Interesting question. Sure, I think it's a great question actually. Yeah. And it, it dovetails with so much of what we're hearing about. And there are folks who are pretty convinced uh, and I know it's a shock to all of us, just kidding. We're all created equally, but we're not, right? From a genetic perspective, we are absolutely not. We don't metabolize things the same way, we, we can't. And when we think of cannabis and cannabinoids as complex and extraordinary a plant as it is, I can't tell you how many people say, oh, but you know, there's probably no issue with other drugs because it's just, you know, it's just the plant. Hold on. There are significant drug-drug interactions with regard to, let's just take our two primary constituents. I know we don't like to take them out of context. I know I don't. CBD has its role among other things, but in any case, um, they both have drug-drug interactions that are pretty significant because of the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. And so when you look at genetic testing or profiles and figure out who's a fast or slow metabolizer, let's say, who has the ability to metabolize THC or CBD more rapidly or, or who gets into more quote, trouble using some of these things, it's a very different story when you look at how people uh, present. So clinically, you've seen, and you've all heard stories about people who say, oh my God, I only had this much and it was a horror show. I couldn't leave my room. I couldn't do this. Cannabis is horrible. It's disgusting. It's terrible. Hold on. Is it the cannabis or is it that genetically you are a very poor metabolizer of THC and your levels are here when they should be here? That's really what it comes down to. And when we think of the ways in which we are treating so many of these things, including assessing for, quote, roadside intoxication, right? Because, you know, they use cannabis and if they're positive for cannabis, they must obviously be intoxicated, which of course is not at all the, the case. Genetic testing absolutely has not begun to see the light of day in the context of cannabis or, or psychedelics, I'm sure. Um, and, and so I think it's an incredibly important area that he would no doubt have quite a bit to say about. Um, because again, it all comes down to the individual. This is not a global thing you can make statements about unless you know the details. That's important. Well, to follow up with what Stacy said, which is entirely correct. And, and Lester, I don't think came to know um, Dr. Brendan McKernan and, and medicinal genomics. Um, uh, he and his brother uh, back in 2009, 2010, I believe, were the first to map the genetic, uh, the genome for cannabis. And so that is a company today that is at the forefront of trying to customize these drugs and put on, I think, my view, 
probably the most scientific oriented medical cannabis conference. Uh, the next one's in San Diego later in the year, that along with uh, Patients Out of Time, uh, which is comes from more of a grassroots, but uh, is incredibly comprehensive and detailed, are the two great scientific conferences that people can go to if medicinal um, aspects are what really float your boat. But yes, this is uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, Brendan and his uh, company now are at the centerpiece of um, driving this whole discussion around genetics and cannabis in a way we could not have thought of 10 years ago. What are the issues? I mean, what? How, how will this, this subject of genetics and cannabis impact us? I, you know, I'm not quite sure I understand that. Can Stacey or Alan? Oh, sure. So, so think of what you know about people who take very little alcohol to get drunk. Think of what we know about certain ethnic groups with low levels of something like alcohol dehydrogenase or an inability to process alcohol effectively, right? So very little gets people intoxicated. You see this flashing, you see all sorts of things. Genetically, they literally cannot process alcohol the same way that others can. We, they just can't. And so if you think of it this way, and, and forgetting about the obvious drug-drug interactions with other things on board, if you are a poor metabolizer of, of THC, and it's the CYP2C9 SNP or, or single nucleotide polymorphism, if you are a poor metabolizer, you wind up, just to say, for the sake of the argument, you have a consumable. Any delta-9 THC is converted in your liver to the more psychoactive or intoxicating 11-hydroxy. And guess what happens? You're not processing it the same way as somebody who's a really good metabolizer and you have greater levels that are going to make you, let's just say, more intoxicated for a longer period of time. It's this classic story where people say, holy crap, it's never going to end. That's not what they said. It's much worse. Than and, and many people have been there and, and they turn to you know, sort of the, the idea that it's obviously the cannabis, but for many people, even a little THC is too much. So-called microdosing, you know, th this argument prevails everywhere. And Rick, I'm sure you hear it all the time. Well, microdosing is, you know, five milligrams is a microdose. Hold on, one milligram may be too much for some people because we see it. The big thing is when we can combine, and, and medicinal genomics is a great example, when we combine what we know about people's individual genetic profiles, but you have to go ahead and sample it, and what we see in terms of use patterns only really best assess when you know what they're getting, not what you think they're getting, um, can you make these kinds of statements. But it's incredibly important. And, and it's likely weighing into things like cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. You know, the ICRS, International Cannabinoid Research Society, and the College on Problems of Drug Dependence Conferences are both this week. And there have been lots of presentations about both these things. Genetics has just begun. In the, in the words of the immortal Karen Carpenter, we've only just begun <laughs> when we get to that part of it because it's going to play out pretty significant. And, and there are no research studies so far that are grabbing genetics from your patients and clinical trial information from your patients and looking at outcomes. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not happy that we're the first because we've just started, but somebody should be doing this. Uh, big time. Can I just, can I just add a quick point? Like, just a very quick point to what Stacy said, and then I do have a... Um, Ibogaine story from my dad. Um, just that's why some people had, have no reaction to edibles because they metabolize it really quickly. Uh, Cause there are certain genetic subtypes that are like virtually immune to edibles. They can have these huge quantities of cannabis edibles and nothing happens. 70, um, 80 milligrams, nothing. Right, it's astounding. Um, so anyways, my mom told me the story of when Carl Sagan and my dad went to visit Terrence McKenna on an island and Terrence McKenna gave them the huge quantity of Ibogaine to, to bring back to the United States. And my dad and Carl Sagan were gonna go take it. And apparently you throw up after taking it and then you trip for like days on end. And my mom was like, absolutely not. You guys are not coming home, smuggling it illegally and then throwing up all over our house, which I'm, she's gonna have to clean up and then hallucinating for three days. So my mom made them give it away. So my dad uh -huh. was close to having like a, three day long trip with Carl Sagan at our house in Wellesley. But my mom drew the line. Rare, rarely did she put any limits on him at all, but with the Ibogaine, uh, the huge bottle that Terrence McKenna gave them, she, she drew the line. So there was an Ibogaine story. Well, that's a great segue into another question someone submitted. This is a distinguished questioner. I don't know who it is, but he says the following. I met Lester, Betsy and family in the 1980s at the nuclear Nevada nuclear test site, along with Carl Sagan, Annie Drurian, and John Mackin family. It's my conviction that the visionary substances dignified by Dr. Grinspoon's work 
helped to alert many of us to the planetary threats like nukes, climate change, and et cetera. Comments. Anybody want to comment on that? Visionary substances dignified helped alert us to the planetary threats. Well, uh, yeah. I certainly well, I would just simply before Rick uh, articulates, I would say for somebody who's enjoyed psychedelics more than once in my life, uh, that one of the things you certainly do is appreciate that you are just one organism <laughs> and that there's a whole bunch of other things going on in this world and universe. And uh, if Carl was in that conversation, I'm sure it was quite uh, cosmic. Uh, Rick? Well, I was to say that uh, John Mack had an organization called Psychology and Social Change. It was a, a group at Harvard. And I think that, that Lester and John Mack, and, and they understood that there was something about this um, moving from the egocentric uh, position um, to this um, ego dissolution and this sense of connection to, um, you know, the greater whole, that that had important political implications, meaning that it would be an antidote in a way to um, racism, to genocide, to thinking that you could just throw stuff out. There's no out. It's all together to, to protecting the planet. So there was that real understanding of the nexus between psychology, psychedelics, mysticism, and social change. And I think that's one of the promises of psychedelics that's really focused on uh, why I focused my life on that, because I believe in that. And I felt the times that I had shared with uh, Lester talking about that, and also with John Mack, that uh, they validated it. You could say that that's sort of the extreme of the hippie beliefs, you know, that somehow these psychedelics will, will help change the world, it'll give people a new perspective. But when somebody like uh, Lester and also John Mack and Daniel Ellsberg, who is part of this community, um, you know, validated it, um, it, it gave those of us who are uh, younger and more inexperienced uh, courage to keep going. So I, I, I very much hope that the kind of work that you have with, with cannabis, that it, that it kind of helps people to um, feel more connected, to move not so much in a more creative way to think in a more creative way to not be so egocentric to be more in your body that these tools have important medical advantages that we've talked about they have important recreational advantages recreational in the best sense of recreate of regenerate renew but they also have important political implications and it doesn't mean that everybody becomes um, a left-wing democrat i mean you could have any different per political perspective, but I think it does help people to understand our um, sense of connection and that that is really where compassion can come from and where understanding and appreciation of differences. And I think Lester really helped uh, point the way towards that. Indeed. Uh, three words I wrote down tonight that I thought uh, may summarize our discussion are respectability, credibility, and validation. Those three things that Lester brought to the uh, to the reconsideration of marijuana and other drugs. Um, it's 825. Uh, this is anybody want to comment on any of the issues we talked about? Um, we go back. I yes. To piggyback off yes. of uh, something Stacy said earlier about cannabis. We were talking about uh, the genetics and and there's a term that we use clinically endocannabinoid tone that that really determines your dose of cannabis and your effective dose of cannabis, whether you're a micro doser or you know, uh, someone who wants to take uh, 20, 25, 30 milligrams of cannabis. But the endocannabinoid tone actually reflects the state of the balance, the excess or deficiency of your own endocannabinoid system. And it's governed by, as Stacy mentioned, a combination of the synthetic pathways and inactivation involving transport and degradation. And, and so it also reflects the availability of your own endocannabinoid levels and the number and availability of cannabinoid receptors for exogenous cannabinoids with which to interact. So there's, there's a lot that goes into to cannabis and that's why every patients have to self-regulate and self-titrate because one's own hemostatic, homeostatic, excuse me, tone is crucial to the consideration for dosing. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to add that to the 
discussion. Thank you, Janesta. And thank you so much to all the panelists tonight. It's been a fabulous discussion. Um, uh, and I want to say thank you so much to the UMass Library, not only for undertaking this uh, collection, but also especially providing this, uh, this uh, event tonight. Uh, with that, uh, Aaron, I'll turn it back over to you. And uh, thanks again to all the panelists. Yeah, thank you, Dick. And I, I just want to add my thank you also to all the panelists. I mean, it was an incredibly informative and, and actually quite moving discussion hearing stories about Lester and understanding, you know, his context and his impact and the impact that, you know, is, is, is likely to have. I think this is something that you had mentioned, Janester, that I think one of the really exciting and powerful aspects of um, his papers and making them available to researchers is that the impact that he's had on you and so many others in the audience and elsewhere in the world, it can actually continue to move forward uh, into further generations. So, um, it, I, I really appreciate all of you taking the time to, to join us and, and, and having such a wonderful discussion. And I also want to mention again um, our, our plans to, to hold another event uh, a year from now around the same time of year um, to really be able to, to sort of dig deeper into, into Lester and his legacy and, and see each other face to face and, and have conversations like this and, and also conversations with friends and people that we haven't seen for a long time in person, which is something I know that we're all all craving. Um, Aaron, don't forget to yeah. mention the fundraising. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, again, the, the link uh, for donating is at minutefund.umass.edu slash Grinspoon Fund. Um, we uh, really appreciate all of your help and support and your investment in what already is and I think will really continue to be, um, you know, the most important place to research um, drug policy and in particular the, uh, the anti-prohibition movements um, for cannabis and psychedelics and, and, and other drugs. So thank you all um, and I hope everyone has a, a wonderful weekend. Thank you.